that we um, have, having won, won those contacts. So, so that's a, a minimum level. Um, perhaps ask Steve, um, happy to comment from the phone's perspective, but when we move to LTE, the potential for that five megabits minimum to increase, um, I think, Steve. Steve. Well, Kia ora. Just, just going back to a question over there about what can rural communities do. Um, I'm from the East Coast, and it was basically just uh, getting together with a local um, uh, Wi-Fi provider and just expanding, expanding that really. And it was all, um, you know, it's worked out pretty good for us. We've managed to get it into a lot of communities through working with them. Um, Fortunately, he, uh, Gisman.net got, got part of the RBI funding, so he was able to expand it into, into schools, but we've just sort of back, backed off that and looked after our, our own communities, really. Thank you. Good. Steve? Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Steve Rieger. I'm from Vodafone, and um, I actually led our rural um, pitch with uh, Chorus, and so I've got a good perspective on, on the speed question, which I'd like to answer. So as the contract stands, we are committed to a speed and coverage responsibility. So there's about 295,000 rural address points, or rural house, rural families, rural fam yeah, rural houses. And we, we have to cover 80% of them. So the mass on that would leave about 50 something thousand, 50,000 not done. Now we ended up with our modeling, working out we could cover more than that. So we've actually committed to doing 83% of them, and at the same time, Chorus are expanding their cabinet prioritisation program, and where they're taking their cabinets, so they're taking some of them to areas we don't go and won't be going. So they picked up another 3% of the population. So t in total, of 295,000 homes, about 86% will get coverage, broadband coverage, to come inside the five-year plan. Now the. Vodafone has responsibility for the um, uh, community coverage, so the speed and performance of what's been on offer. And to the lady over there's question about the dongle, which is dead right. I mean, the little stick that we add to a laptop or a desktop is not the final answer for broadband speed because it's aerial, is only a centimetre long inside that little stick. So we've actually come up with a solution which requires a roof mounted aerial and that goes down to the router and the router can be connected to a PC or the router can be broadcast wirelessly. Now the speed, the question of speed is first and foremost what everybody most worries about. What are they going to get as a performance? And there's this number of five megs that's stuck in everybody's mind. Um, in actual fact it's not a minimum, it's a maximum in contract. Our minimum is a lot, lot less than that. But it's just not a practical, don't, don't think about it as this is where it's staying. This is just a technology spot in time. And we're on a journey of ever increasing speed and performance. So every cell site we've built to date, we've built 14 new ones. And we've upgraded approximately 80 of the existing towers. They all got 21 megs per second broadcast speed right now. But the router, the only router available, can only receive seven maximum. So there's straight away a cap. We will have a 21 meg router by Christmas. Now, from this point on, we're rolling out 42 meg on all of the new new sites, and we'll have to go back and upgrade the existing, existing ones, which is a bit of a frustration because we got caught in a technology change. So we're doing 42 megs <coughs> virtually immediately. But there's no equipment to take it. But it's ready because all of the equipment manufacturers are coming out with ever-increasing speeds of their devices. But the big question for you, and I, I think it's a great challenge, and the government uh, being represented here, the next generation of technology, the 4G or LTE, relies on us getting, us being the mobile, the wireless companies, not just us. Um, getting the 700 megahertz spectrum available. The next generation of technology has broadcast speeds immediately at about 100 megabits per second. In Europe, our sister Opco is delivering consistently um, a performance in the home for rural 
um, German households of between 15 and 20 megabits per second. That's in a contended network at peak times. And by the way, if you all get up at three in the morning and go on your website, you'll find your performance is way better than at five o'clock at night. Because we run a network that deals with contention. So if more people get on, everybody shares a little bit of the bandwidth and it gets slower. At three in the morning, everyone's asleep and you're sometimes the only user. It goes like a rocket ship. And that's normal. So we worry about the peak times and at the peak times we think we'll be delivering when the next generation comes out well over, well over uh, 10 megs per second up to 20 megs per second is practical. And that, that's on 700 megahertz. If we don't get to 700 megahertz, this conversation is going to be completely different. So the question from Sarah is, would we prioritise rural if we got 700 megahertz? And, and it is my, I'm going to give you an opinion on this, not the company philosophy, because if you, if you quote me as that, I'd be doing the company a disservice. My opinion is, yes, we will do just that, because I think it's the right thing to do. Just on that one point, um, the radio spectrum team at MED is, is, is currently working through the process by which they auction that, that, that spectrum. Um, again, they, they've gone out with discussion documents and, and been a lot of submissions on that. Um, I think the, the, the important thing, as Steve is saying, is, is the speed by which they can, they can get that, that out. They've clear that the spectrum will be cleared of broadcasting um, by, by, I think, the end of 2013. In the next year. Um, and, and what what we really need is that auction process to, to be ready to, you know, allow the winners of the auction to start implementing immediately. The auction process can also put requirements on the winners as to things like, do they roll out from the outside in? Do, do they start deploying in rural in advance of, of urban? Um, so, so there are um, cover there is the potential for, for, for that to be factored into the auction process and again when we've made submissions on, on, on the discussion documents Internet New Zealand has said you know that should be um, a significant thing that, that, that rural communities should get um, access sooner you know because if it was just left to Vodafone and, 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 and Telecom and Two Degrees as, as the providers, their, their business incentive is always to roll out in urban first because that's where the majority of customers lie, of course. But the government can turn that around by, say, by, by, in, by saying through the auction pro process, part of this deal is you, know, you, you must start deploying in rural at the same time as you start deploying in urban. Andy? So, th th thanks for the information on that, but I'm still hearing that we're talking about rural narrowband initiative and not rural broadband initiative, because the definition Crown Fibre Holdings of broadband is 50, 50, you know, 50 megs up, 50 megs down. So we're not actually talking about broadband, we're talking about something that doesn't, isn't really broadband. It's much faster than we get now, but you know, when are we going to lift our sights? The, that definition from the guy yesterday from Cleveland, and this is a very poor part of the United States, and they're rolling this out at gig speeds, gig speeds, to the, to the centres, and then it gets found out from here. So the rural sector here is always, always, always going to be behind the, the fibre sector, because it will take three years to do this, and then, the, you know, the... Yep. the uh, the fibre sector will have increased its speeds, and you know why? Well, I mean, that's, I think it's a call to arms to people to sort of think about this stuff and actually start pushing. Not just for this isn't good enough. It's great that it's happening, but it's n it's never going to be good enough because it needs to be better. Um, can I just say um, that we're talking about rural, remote, and where I'm from, there is rural and there is remote. Yep. No one's going to stick a million dollars worth of fibre and a $500,000 million, uh, $500, tower up to service 70 people. That's, right. That's remote. 
yeah. 10 people down the road here, 10 people down the road here. I think that the rural broadband has covered a majority of that area. So, in a sense, we're bickering over a speed when the people that have all the say or, 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 or want to put something up are not having a say because all these people that are on 100 megabits are deciding what's good for them. Mm. When is it? When is the day that MED is actually going to talk to those communities? Because there's been run around with all these other communities that are called rural, and the remote communities are left over on the side there. The other side is is that I'm just trying to figure out what happened to the funding round or the tender round for those remote schools, because that's what the target was. Does anyone know that? Well, you know, um, so Jared from, from Chorus. Hi, I'm Gerard Lindstrom from Chorus, uh, and I, <coughs> like Steve Riga, have probably visited uh, most of the communities in New Zealand uh, talking about rural broadband rollout, uh, and more recently uh, some of the major centres talking about ultra-fast broadband rollout. Uh, in terms of, uh, if you think back this time last year, there was a major debate about um, Zone 3 schools, all of the schools that weren't in RBI funding, weren't in the UFB funding and what was going to happen to them. That was all resolved in a tender that was put out last November, December. It was settled in uh, April, May this year. Uh, tenders were awarded to about four odd companies around New Zealand. Um, the uh, really remote schools, it was accepted that uh, you were never, ever going to be able to cost-effectively deliver 100 megabits per second to a school that had a single classroom and perhaps six or eight pupils. Um, there just wasn't the will to spend the money. Um, so the MED altered its stance and said, we're not going to ask for a national supply. We'll pick off those schools one at a time and approach the local providers and said, look, what's the best service we can get to that school? And utilise the, the, the uh, infrastructure that's already there. So in the case of um, the East Coast, you know, there is actually quite a thriving uh, local Wi-Fi provider. They were able to put their hand up and say, look, to get to that school and that school, um, this amount of money will enable us to extend our Wi-Fi reach, and on the way we can pick up half a dozen houses. So that's a pragmatic solution that they went for and adopted, and that model was sort of just taken around the country for those really ultra-remote schools. Um, you know, these are the sort of schools where one family moving in or out of the district could either halve or double the school role, uh, and in some cases close that school. So you know, we are not talking about um, large and easy to reach uh, centres of population. As Ray said, um, you know, even with the best will in the world, it's hard to justify spending the amount of money you have to to get to those places. So, um, but let's not forget that the role of RBI was to build a platform for others to leverage off. Um, you know, all the good work that Vodafone's doing around building big towers to provide community coverage, um, Chorus is then required to come along and build fibre to the base of that tower, so they've got some way of um, backhauling that broadband back to main centres. Um, but part of the deal that Chorus has signed up to with the MED is that tower is now um, funded by RBI, so the capital costs don't have to be recovered. So the normal um, commercial rate that you'd pay to get co-location on that tower goes away. So there is an opportunity for local and regional Wi-Fi providers to hang their equipment on those high sites and they can buy a regulated backhaul service on the fibre that Chorus is laying to get um, cost-effective big fat pipes back to um, the regional and national internet. Now, I think one of, the, one of the questions I'm often asked when I stand up in front of <coughs> excuse me, uh, regional and district councils is, OK, so you guys are doing that much. What should we invest our money in? Like, you know, I've got all the ideas. Um, the, the idea, the, the, the response I usually feed back is, you know, communities themselves need to look at where are the centres of unmet demand? Now, do you want to fill them for social, regions, social reasons, uh, for uh, strategic reasons, um, 
is there some business driver, uh, some sort of industry cluster that you want to support? Uh, work that out, and then I think the, the answer to how you're going to meet that demand starts to become self-apparent, because then you can work out um, whether it's in the interest of the local council to chip in some money to do that, whether there's an industry initiative you can pull together, um, or as a social initiative, start looking at some uh, social agency funding to get there, and not rely on it as necessarily delivering internet to these people, but a means to delivering social and educational services, perhaps. Um, because looking to uh, you know, a Wi-Fi guy to you know, spend $100,000 or $200,000 to put up a, an aerial to see if anybody wants to buy it, uh, they just aren't funded like that. Their, their business aren't structured like that. But if you can go to a local Wi-Fi guy and say, there's 15 or 20 of us, and if you build it, we'll sign a two-year contract to take that service then that gives that local guy some sense of um, uh, you know, uh, uh, something he can take to the bank and build out for you. Um, but you know, we are talking about small people. Um, we are talking about you know, people that are capital constrained. But they are out there and they are willing to provide these services. Um, it's just they don't have the heft of capital behind them that um, we have. Uh, but they also have a local focus. One of, one of the big challenges, particularly about ultra-remote areas is, um, you know, because they're a long way away from something, uh, centre of, of population, when it stops working, it might take two days for somebody to get from Rotorua or Gisborne to fix this thing. So again, working with local Wi-Fi guys for really remote communities means that you've got somebody local who can support it. Mm. Sure. Um, just going back on to what Mark was saying, I don't want to be contentious. Vodafone, Telecom got their lines of their lines of their battlefield, right? And they stepped up, of course. Of course. Right? <laughs> and the part is, the part is, is that what you're saying is, MED wants to know what the communities are going to do, right? Well, the first things they did was close their schools, but the communities didn't move. The schools closed down, and the communities had to take their kids further away. So they now became an isolated or remote area. They're on the edges of, well, I call it the universe and the best part of it. But the part is, is that we've been there. We've sat down there with them, right? Now, they ain't going to listen to anything that the small guys say because there's all this hype about 10 megabits, 100 megabits coming to the rural broadband initiative, right? So they're just going to kick all the Wi-Fi guys and all the WiMAX guys to the side because they're getting this marketing from the big guys that are coming with these fantastic uh, 100 megabit speeds. That's one of our issues. That's our biggest problem is that we're getting over-marketed with hype. So how do we fix that so that we can provide a service to those communities that need it? So, so I, th I think what we're saying there, <coughs> excuse me, there is, is there a map effectively of <coughs> those those communities? Sorry. <coughs> uh, is is there a map of those communities that won't be covered by the RBI available? You know, and, and whose responsibility is it to put that map out? So there's somebody over here. Hi. Hi, Jim. Um, I'd like to make a couple of points. I'd like to understand something, first of all, and that is, and I'm sure that there's somebody here can, can clarify this, and that's the relationship of the time of the TSO review. And I think nobody's mentioned it, but I think the TSO stands for Telecommunications Services Social Obligations. obligations. So it's basically what do, what, are, what are the telcos obligated to do mm -hmm. for people for whom it wouldn't be otherwise profitable to provide mm -hmm. a service. And I'm very concerned that you're kind of an, you're sp speaking about that, and I know that you're well connected in government, so I'm kind of concerned that that's the government's view, that maybe we don't need any telecommunications services obligations into the future. And I think that the, the neat sort of... Sp <coughs> The neat bringing together of poor urban people and rich rural people is probably an indication of a, a, a neat sort of 
statement that maybe goes on in government, and that's a real concern to me. And I think that internet users have an absolute um, interest and a desire in not the TSO review becoming redundant, but actually becoming far more relevant into the future. And I think the reason for that is that without adequate access to the internet, people are likely to be far more disadvantaged than they were previously by not having access to a telephone as <coughs> health, education, um, access to government. Government's got a commitment to provide its services electronically. If it doesn't back that up with a, telecom a, a renewed telecommunications um, and internet obligation, mm. then the, you may as well tear up the desire to deliver services because there will be people who are marginalised mm. and people who can't access them. Um, what I'd be really keen to know is about the relationship between the TSO review and the au auction of broadband services uh, through the uh, 700 megabit spectrum because um, the issue, it seems to me, is that that auction is basically focused on ma ma maximising the benefit to the players, uh, or, ma or potentially maximising the benefit to government from the levies that it can get from the um, selling of uh, broadband um, spectrum, rather than the de delivery of services to New Zealand's people. Mm. So the timing, obviously, is, is um, important there. Mm. Um. I can't, I can't speak for the government and, and no longer work for the government, but, but I, th I think, and that, that will probably correct me if I'm wrong, the government has already said that, that maximising the revenue from the auction of that spectrum is not the major priority. You know, they, they, they've accepted that, that they would take a, a hit on, on the amount of revenue they could get in return for other benefits, and, and those other benefits that, that uh, I think I, I started to outline earlier might be that the, the telcos have to roll out in rural areas first or, or um, at the same time as they roll out in, in, in urban. Now, we won't know that definitely until we see the terms of the auction. You know, which is why, again, I've said that the sooner we, we, we can see the terms of the auction, the sooner would be the opportunity for, for... Can you speak to the timing of the auction and the TSO review? Because that might be something that might change the timing of the auction and the TSO review. They, they will be approximately around the same time. The, the Government, they have to clear the broadcasting spectrum first of all, before before they can sell the spectrum to 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 to, to the cellular companies or, or to wireless companies. Um, that that clearance is, is is due towards the end of this year. Um, they then will will have to auction it. Um, so 2013 would would be the time um, when the auction would normally take place. The TSO review is also scheduled for 2013, so they will be going on much the same time. I, I guess that what we would want to see are the terms of the auction, which will be published before the auction, of course, coming out as soon as possible. Um, because that, I think, would be the, the place where um, input on, on those terms um, is going to be um, very valuable. Somebody down here? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I just wanted to sort of further talk about the TSO review and sort of say, from my perspective, it's incredibly important, you know, for the rural and remote sector, but for everyone. And, you know, this is something that you see sort of linked to the UFB um, in Australia, the NBN, that actually TSOs globally are on the way. And I think we need to think very carefully, you know, it also worried me what you said, Reg, sort of when you couch it in terms of a TSO being something that can be game played and being actually something that's poor, subsidizing the rich. Hmm. But it's actually about making a commitment, having an obligation for access. Hmm. And when I hear chorus, you know, and, and players talking about um, justifying, you know, connecting, that's the difference between having a market justification for connecting and saying we have an obligation hmm. to connect people. 
and having a universal service obligation. And you know, I mentioned the NBN and U UFB because when we pull up our copper, we're losing that TSO. You know, you're then relying on power to have VoIP. And you know, it's an issue in Australia that you know you can sort of as an extra add-on buy a battery. You know, that'll last you 12 hours. And in disaster, you know, this is an issue for everyone, but particularly in rural and remote regions where you don't have good mobile coverage. You know, these are big questions about our day-to-day, -day, you know, lives, but also about disaster and, and sort of, you know, things, all the potential reasons that we need, you know, health and government. <coughs> Lawrence? G'day. Um, I'm Lawrence Wimfer. Um, I'm here with a number of colleagues from the Computers and Homes team, and I'd just like to pick up the conversation with colleagues from uh, Chorus and Vodafone. Um, we have uh, half of our families that we connect through our program uh, don't have phone lines, and we've been trying to find solutions for them. So we have turning to the Wi-Fi operators, uh, who are doing a fantastic service. So. F frankly, I don't see a problem with the, wi the local Wi-Fi <coughs> operators who will get in and do stuff, low cost, do it fast, can really work. Our issue is how we leverage on the backbone, or the RBI backbone. Uh, so we've got one school in Kaingaroa Forest, got a chorus fibre sitting there, disconnected, but it's sitting in the school. We'd like to use that fibre as backhaul for Wi-Fi to the community, to a local business in Kaingaroa Forest. Um, uh, none of them can afford what we expect. We can't get a price for a start from a retail service provider as to because they can't get a price from Chorus <coughs> is their argument. So we're wondering whether you know, this is not so much the remote. This is where this is the RBI. So it actually should be in your other category. It's not the. It's not they are covered by RBI. Um, the, uh, the investment's been made. The fibre is there. Um, how do we get to use that fibre? Is what we'd like to do to support the community, the local business, and the school. Only 34 kids in the school, so 100 megs um, is going to be pretty cool for that school, for 34 kids. They don't really need it. They can't afford it, actually. Um, this, but if we split it three ways, uh, that cost between the community, the school, and the business, it would all work. And Kaingaroa Forest could be the most digitally connected village in our, in our country. <laughs> um, and it's all half. It's, 90% of it seems to be there, but we're having real trouble. So I'm, I'm delighted to see some faces from Chorus, and, and Chorus can't talk to us because we're not an RSP, so they tend to say, go and talk to your RSP. So hopefully within the room, there's either an RSP and a Chorus and a whatever can say, how do we solve that problem? We've, um, we understand from MED that it's not, it's a bit vague in the rules and the agreement with Telecom slash Chorus, well, it was originally Telecom, now Chorus, uh, it's a bit vague about whether that 100 meg link, in fact, at the school, in the school cabinet, can be used to support links to the community. Or, But from what our colleague from Chorus was saying before, the whole point, the principle of the RBI, it's a platform for others to use. So the principle seems to say there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to use that shared infrastructure, but I guess it comes down to price. If we can use the 100 meg, split it three ways, split the price three ways. But if we have to buy three 100 megs for three different services in Kaingaroa Forest, it'll sit there, unterminated, unused for the you know, for an indefinite future. So, so, I, so, yeah. so just clarification there, Lawrence. Is that an issue of the school? Is it the Board of Trustees that are saying you can't use this? Is this an issue for Chorus? Is this an issue for the Ministry of Education? We don't quite know. The, the, the school don't know. They, they just, the court fibre was put in and it came in and the school says, what happens now? Um, so no one's approached them as no RSP has approached them to offer them service. So it sits there. So they're saying, fine, we're very happy to okay. use the infrastructure in the school. Um, the community is very happy to have wireless sort of connect connectivity okay. um, in their community. Can we um, let Gerard yeah, just yeah. respond for, for Corvus? Because that... I think it's quite an important issue, and it, it's not just Kangaroo Forest. I mean, the, the, there's probably a hundred communities like that want, wanting to do something exactly the same. So. Right. Let's just dispel a couple of myths, shall we? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. 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 Well, now let's dispel the myth. The myth is that um, Chorus does not have a price for retail service providers to buy services over the RBI. The prices were published in our standard contract August, September last year. 
any ISP that wants to come and talk to Chorus and sign a non-disclosure agreement can see the price list for the last six months. And about 82 of them, I think, to date have done that. There is no secret about the price. And that's a reasonably easy process. Mm. Yeah. There is, there is no sign a cheque for a million dollars before you can see the contract or any of that bullshit. We have a complete transparent process to present our RBI and our UF product, UFB products to the industry. There is, however, a big problem for retail service providers to build services over fibre that has gone completely unspoken about. You cannot take a DSL network and plug UFB and RBI fibre connections in it and then say, I now have an ultra-fast broadband network. It will fall over. <coughs> ISPs have to buy a whole bunch of new equipment, big, big gigabit capable routers, big switches. They have to re-architect their entire network. They have to buy new national backhaul. They then have to work out which communities they actually want to serve. Are they going to start just in Auckland and be a local Auckland service provider? Are they going to be a national provider? What are they going to do? They have to design completely new products. They have to design completely new provisioning processes to support those products. They then probably have to build a new billing platform in order to be able to run it. So a lot of ISPs have actually spent a lot of time in the last six to eight months in our network innovation lab prototyping all of that sort of stuff and testing whether it will work. Two minutes to add. So the, the, one of the big problems is um, you know, we're rushing out there laying fibre to schools. The retail service providers didn't get a heads up on, hey, this is now going to happen. You know, it fell out of the sky on top of a lot of them, and now they're playing catch up. So there is, there is seriously a lot of work going on behind the scenes in the retail service provider market. There are, I think, four to date that have declared their hand and said that they will sell UFB services or RBI services to schools. Um, the problem is, of course, they're still learning how they're going. So a retail service provider in Auckland ain't going to offer service to a school in Invercargill. They want to be able to walk down the road and check that it's working, and that's going to be a fact of life for a little while, but it'll come right. The second point um, was about using services um, at the school. Um, I think I read a press release from the uh, Dunedin Digital Leadership Forum. They are taking the UFB service to a central Dunedin school, putting a Wi-Fi antenna on the roof, and going to deliver Wi-Fi services to adjacent um, low-income uh, families that live around that school. I think it's a decile one school. So <coughs> if they can do it in central Dunedin, why can't you do it in Kaingaroa? Right. Je before we get many more hands up, I've got gentlemen at the side of the room waving to me saying the next session's due to come in here in, 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 in a couple of minutes. We, we, we've got six minutes. Can, can, can I just answer that really yeah. as well? Because the Dunedin has still got faith. We're across the Dunedin situation. We're involved with that as well, with Adam Peterson and his family. Um, I don't believe they have that situation clarified about the, the shared use of that infrastructure for, for the school because there's uh, the issues of the... So, it, again, I, I'm not, it's not just a chorus issue. FX is involved with it as a service provider there. Um, but the issue of this... Uh, shared use, and they can also do lower, they've got lower entry points. UFB, they come in 30 megs, lower priced. It's the RBI one with the 100 meg entry point and the pricing around 100 meg is pushing it. Well, the school estimates in Kaingaroa looks it could be costing four times what they're paying today for their internet connection to go to this, and that's what they said is impossible. So, um, I agree, it's not just Kaingaroa Forest, it's Dunedin, it's in Christchurch, it's in it, as many places where this is happening really, so I, I understood it's, there's a, it, I appreciate who these RSPs are, who will actually deliver the service, we can find out who they are, but um, we're talking to SNAP, we're talking to anybody that's actually out there that is willing to do it, and uh, frankly it's re really, I, I think there's still issues to be dealt with, I don't think it's as, they've done the PR stuff in Dunedin, they haven't got the technology sorted. Yeah. Great. Right. Okay, no, nothing from course. No. This is this is Come. a buoy, and and I'd like uh, something to be broached here. Uh, it'll take ninety seconds. 
Um, Make it 60. <laughs> yes, Steve mentioned that there were areas that Chorus was going to be serving with fixed line broadband that would not be covered by Vodafone. Uh, now, cellular coverage is the number one most important issue to rural New Zealand. I know this having looked at surveys of many parts of rural New Zealand. They want cellular coverage as much as, if not more, than broadband coverage. Now, the least expensive Vodafone tower we've heard of is $480,000. Uh, I have represented groups with budgets who've gone to Vodafone asking for tower builds. The answer has come back, 480000 and you've got to give us a road and resource consent and power. Now, I have been four years in a row to Communicasia, a telecommunications conference in Singapore, where Southeast Asian, Indian, and Chinese carriers come and talk about their networks. The Indians are deploying complete towers for 10,000 US dollars. The Indonesians are deploying complete towers with satellite backhaul for 20,000 US dollars, and that's off grid. Why is it that I can't, as a rural community, go to Vodafone Telecom or Two Degrees with 20 or even $50,000 and get myself a cell site, especially when Chorus is coming with fiber to my local school or with DSL? Why is it? Actually, the, the Indonesians are working for uh, Downer and Transfield putting our fiber in because we couldn't get enough local staff. But uh, I would like someone from Telecom or Vodafone to come and talk to me about why is it that cell towers are costing 10 times as much? Uh, um, 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 so, so, Steve, uh, um, uh, we're, we're, uh, we've got to get out of the room but by 10 past, it's gone 10 past. I just wanted to say, as I said at the beginning, I imagined that, that the range of issues we wanted to discuss um, um, within the given hour was completely impractical. There are, I hope, other opportunities to continue this, this discussion. First one is bar camp, so please, I, th I think um, the opportunity is there for us to sign up at the Internet New Zealand um, desk there and say, look, we want, we want to uh, extend this conversation into the bar camp. Second one would be the mailing list. Um, we got quite a good response initially. Um, it'd be possible to, to, to um, have a, a specific mailing list um, of, of interested people to, to um, um, continue the conversation online. Um, if there's any other suggestions about how we might continue it um, or who else we might want to get involved in, 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 in building on that sort of conversation, please let me know that as well. Thank you very much.